Now, the Dolphins will be playing the Giants on December the 5th. It is a road game down in Florida. That's a Sunday afternoon at 1 o'clock. And to preview Miami's summer training camp, it's Armando Salguero of the Miami Herald. He is so kind to join us today while on vacation. I have to tell you, Armando, you are doing yeoman's job for us. We can't tell you how much we appreciate it. And I know fans down in Miami have been listening to your podcasts and reading your stories now for such a long time. You are a Dolphins girl. Thanks so much for joining us, and we really hope everything is well with you. Oh, no, it's always my pleasure. I'm always thinking about the New York Giants while I'm on vacation. (laughs) (laughs) Well, Well, actually, the funny part about it is, Armando, I actually do that very same thing. (laughs) That I believe. Let's let's open things up by by asking about Tua, the uh, very, very well-known and headline-grabbing quarterback. It is now his job. He goes into training camp. There's no Fitzpatrick around. Tua is the guy. So how prepared is he to lead the Dolphins to a double-digit win playoff season and play a full 17-game slate? Yeah, that's the, that's the question that will determine, the answer will determine the direction of the Dolphins' 2021 season. Obviously, you mentioned he's very well-known. Tua Tonga Vailoa is, is one of the more widely known players uh, at his position. Uh, if you go by jersey sales, but I don't know that it's because of his performance on the field yet. It's it's for other things and for what he did at Alabama. The Dolphins need him to be widely well-known and respected based on performance and actual achievement and production, and that's not been the case yet. Obviously, he's only a second-year player. The Dolphins need him to manifest all the promise that they put on him when they drafted him number five overall in the 2020 uh, draft. Having said that, they're believing that he's capable. They're saying that he's improved on a number of issues that would make that a possi- that possibility a probability. Um, we'll see. We'll, we'll have to see. Now, if he falters, Jacoby Brissett has been brought in to be his backup. And, look, I don't know how much they think about him, but is this a situation where you think the two is going to have a short leash? Or if he struggles, do they just ride it through? Well, last year was short leash time. Last year, as a rookie, Tua got benched twice. And it would have been three times if, they would have, if the Dolphins had had Ryan Fitzpatrick in the season finale because Tua was struggling in that game as well, and he threw three interceptions and the Dolphins got blown out. So last year was short leash year. This year, if he's on a short leash, the, this team has problems because uh, it, it suggests and, in fact, it screams, okay, so he's not the guy you, you, you sold to us. He's not a, a franchise quarterback. If you're benching him to get a spark from Jacoby Brissett, you're in trouble. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, that, that, that is not – it's not a competition. This is a year where Tua, I think, will be given the exact opposite, a long leash, so that he does uh, have the maximum amount of at-bats of opportunities to actually produce. Uh, this sounds to me exactly as when I was growing up, and I didn't have an older brother, but I had a younger brother. And I remember when he was riding a bicycle, and he had those training wheels on it. And uh, all of a sudden, he came to that point, Armando, where the training wheels are off. Okay, now I'm leaving, and you're on your own. That sounds exactly kind of what it is going to be with Tua this year. But here's the thing that I think that I, I've got to believe that he's going to improve. Um I give so much credit to Brian Flores. And when you look at the job that he's done for the years that he's been there, he's really been able to develop a culture in Miami and get the most out of the players, even if they're not as much talented. I know the two is talented. Um, Give me an idea of what this coaching staff, and by the way, they have two play callers this season. Maybe you can uh, comment on that a little bit and how that's going to impact Tua and the way he plays. But I'd like to know, you know, what are some of the really good things that he's doing and some of the things he's continually going to have to work on? 
Right. So with the two offensive co-offensive coordinators, that just weirds me out, to be mm-hmm. honest with you. <laughs> uh, you know, it's like you, you have a two-headed being. That's, that's a monster. <laughs> that's a weirdo. Uh, you want, at least I would say, you want one guy really to be the head and really to be – the guy in charge and the dolphins are doing the collaboration thing. They couldn't decide, decide on one offensive coordinator or the other. So they're going in that direction and I, uh, show me because I don't believe in that. Now, as far as what Tua is doing, look, Tua has through his college career been an, had elite accuracy. He is, he has an instinct for the game. He has an instinct for the pocket. Where I think he has struggled is struggling, first of all, in typical rookie stuff, identifying, you know, the defense, pre-snap reads, moving faster, getting the operation faster uh, through the huddle and into the play. Um, And also the fact that he has a good arm, but – it's not like anyone saying, oh, my gosh, it's a cannon. He's got the best arm in the NFL. And he's got, really, his size is marginal. He's six foot, and, you know, that's great if you're Drew Brees, but he's not <laughs> Drew Brees. And so he has to prove that he can overcome the arm, the size, uh, he's not exactly Michael Vick either, so he's not running away from people. Uh, so he really is going to have to rely on instinct and accuracy, getting the ball out fairly quickly, not getting hit so that he can continue to take snaps because oftentimes if a six foot 215 pound quarterback is hit a lot, uh, that, that's, not, <laughs> that's not sustainable. So all those things have to come in line for him to be successful. And one of the ways that the Dolphins are hoping that that happens is they've put some talent around him that they think should help him, you know, so that he doesn't have to carry the offense. The offense carries itself. Well, let's talk about that for just a second, because Eric Studisville and George Godsey, the co-offensive coordinators, will be drawing up plays for the likes of Jalen Waddell, who just came in from this year's draft, and we all know how highly thought of he was. Will Fuller comes over from Houston. Devontae Parker is there, and he's certainly a terrific player. But I don't see a lot of proven uh, established guys in the running back core. I wonder how imbalanced this offense is going to be, Armando. Right. Yeah, they like Miles Gaskin uh, as their starter, and I guess that's okay. <laughs> that, you, you do. You're being you kind. Have an ability to. You do have an ability to pluck out the 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 nits, don't you? Their running back <laughs> core is not not a team strength by any means. In fact, I would say it's the weakest room in the on the entire team, and. You know, they, they like the fact that uh, they've got Gaskin, they've got Savin Ahmed, uh, you know, Malcolm Brown. Two of those guys were not drafted. Uh, Miles Gaskin was a seventh-round pick. You know, Larry Zonka's not walking through that door. <laughs> so, but, but you know, Armando, so, I have to tell you, Adrian Peterson is still out there, and he's telling people that he's ready to go and he's looking for a job. I would think the Dolphins would be a team that might have some interest. What is it, 2009 or something? I mean, <laughs> I'm just saying, you know, it's not like you've got a bunch of guys there ready to carry the right. ball. Right. Um, look, everyone was expecting them to draft uh, a guy fairly early. They didn't do that. Uh, they continually talked about liking their group. Um, Adrian Peterson is a great name. He's a great player. He's got a great legacy. Trust me, I'm a Hall of Fame uh, selector, and my my expectation is that someday I will be voting for him for entrance into the Hall of Fame. But it's not 
he's not in his prime. <laughs> to uh, say the least. Right. It, it's been a minute since he's uh, entered the league. So uh, I can't speak for the Dolphins. My guess is that they want to – they're a young team. They want to go with a, with a younger group. Armando, when you talk about Tua, you know, I think that you had mentioned that they surrounded him with some, some guys that can make some plays for him, particularly in the wide receiver area. Um, the one thing about when just kind of researching this team, I, I look at the wide receiver. Obviously, Devontae Parker is, is probably the elite guy on the, on the roster there at that position with Will Fuller, and then they drafted Jalen Waddell. Um, what do you see? I, I kind of see a similarity in all three of those guys. Deep threats. They all can run well. They all can get um, separation. They're good ball hawks. I, I think one of the components missing in that wide receiver room is somebody that can maybe just have that intermediate r- route running tree, something that can help there. What is your assessment of the wide receiver room, and how are they going to get better and be able to help Tua this year? Right. So I think that Devontae has been more of a deep threat out of necessity rather than uh, what he is really more comfortable doing. He's a 6'5", you know, 220-pound guy who runs well but isn't really going to, you know, blow the top off of defenses consistently. So now they have Jalen Waddell who runs like a 4'3", and obviously Will Fuller has a reputation and is been productive getting deep on defenses. So I think that that assignment will go to them, whereas with, with Parker, you're going to see more, like you, you mentioned, you know, the, uh, the crossing routes, the, 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 the intermediate routes. It, it's not going to be necessarily Devontae, you got to get, you know, behind a guy to, to help us or you're not doing your job anymore. Well, this is Guerrero from Miami Herald up, joining yeah. us to preview the Miami Dolphins on Big Blue Kickoff Live. Matt Skura comes over from Baltimore, an established center who's done a good job in this league, and he will be anchoring what is uh, looks to me like a very young offensive line. Armando, how will they hold up? Yeah, that's been a big question down here in South Florida for a long time because The Dolphins have spent a lot of resources, a lot of resources, both in free agency and the draft, trying to shore up the offensive line. And really, it hasn't worked so far. Um, (laughs) Last year alone, they, they, they paid Eric Flowers to come as a free agent from Washington. And one year later, they're trading him back to Washington. So, and they paid the guy ten million dollars a year, uh, and now and they're paying part of his salary to go away. So that tells you that not all of the decisions have been great decisions. They spent a first round pick on their left tackle, Austin Jackson, last year. So in year two, he's got to make a, you know, something of a of a jump. Uh, they spent a second round pick uh, on Robert Hunt to play right tackle last year and he's being moved to to guard now so again resources spent but we're at that point in the development of this team and it's not just offensive line by the way we are at that point in the development of the team where people aren't going to buy potential anymore yes you you went out and you did great things and you did a lot there was a lot of activity but now folks down here are expecting achievement. It's no longer about you did a lot of stuff. It's we need the stuff to actually work. So quickly, if you can give us a thumbnail of maybe one or two things you're excited about with their defense, uh, address Jalen Phillips if you could, and then maybe one or two things that you think they really need to worry about on their defense. Right. Well, I mean, their defense was the strength of the team last year. They were, I think, number five overall in, uh, in scoring defense, which is, you know, elite. So they have a playoff caliber defense. Uh, they, they would argue that they have possibly the two best, you know, corners in the NFL, the best cornerback tandem in the NFL. Uh, Xavier and Howard led the NFL in interceptions last year, was an all pro. And, uh, so 
they have guys that can get after the ball. They, they drafted Jalen Phillips because they want more pressure on the quarterback. To do that, they had to cut um, – some people, but it, look, Kyle Van Noy was brought in as a free agent last year, and then this year he was cut. <laughs> it, that, that's kind of the culture down here, to be honest with you. <laughs> if you don't produce in one year, you're gone. And so uh, that happened, but Jalen Phillips is supposed to step in. Andrew Van Ginkle is supposed to step in. They do have uh, players that they believe are going to get after the quarterback. And if they are able to do that, they believe that they can play their man press. They believe that they will turn the ball over and serve up, you know, opportunities for the offense. My, my question about all that is it's hard to count on 19 interceptions for the season every year. That's hard to do. Eventually, offenses kind of try to figure out ways to not throw interceptions and uh, not challenge Xavier Howard as much, maybe. And, you know, if, if your team's success depends on turnovers, that's fine for a year or every other year, but it's hard to do that every single year. That's, that's my question. I would say to you, Armando, that both Eric Rowe and Xavier Howard uh, had career years. Uh, and, and to be honest, both of their NFL careers have been rather checkered. They've been up and they've been down. Uh, can, you, can you guarantee they're, they're both going to have terrific years this year? Right. No. I, I mean, Xavier, is, uh, Xavier has been up and down based on injury. But whenever xavier has been on the field, he's been very productive. I think um, he has more interceptions per game than just about anybody in the NFL the last four years. So uh, that, that doesn't worry me. His health, obviously, he has a knee issue that, that is a concern. And, oh, by the way, <laughs> he missed all of the offseason because uh, he wants a raise so, <laughs> on a contract that he's got four years remaining on. So there's that. That's not good. Uh, and, yeah, we don't know if he is going to show up for – you know, training camp or at what point he will show up, but he didn't show up for the off season conditioning. He didn't show up for, um, you know, any of the OTAs or the mandatory minicamp. Armando, let me, last question for me, if you don't mind, obviously being from the university of Miami, I, I a little more information on Jalen Phillips, um, watched him play last year. We were all very high on him coming out of college. A lot, like a lot of the scouts and organizations were, what are some of the things that you're hearing or seeing from the team that they're going to take precautions with him, of course, with the concussions and things? You know, obviously the, the, the talent is immense there. And I'm just curious how they're – what you're hearing down there, how they're going to – are they going to do anything for him, an extra padded helmet or – you know what I'm saying? So give me a little bit of, of insight on what you see in Jalen and what they're going to be able to do for him this season. Well, I think, first of all, what you're going to see is that he's not going to be – hands in the dirt every single down. Mm -hmm. So he's not going to have one of those car collisions, you know, 70 times a game. Okay. Um, he's going to, you know, play linebacker. He's going to drop there. He's going to do the things that they ask their, their outside linebackers to do. And of course that includes rush the passer. But like I just said, it's not 70 times a day where you're crashing into somebody uh, at the line of scrimmage. So that's number one. Number two, if he, you know, they're not going to ask him to do this immediately. Their desperation is not, we need Jalen Phillips or bust. In fact, right now, I don't know that he's even a starter. They're going to work him in slowly uh, and use him mostly as a, uh, as a rush guy on, on passing down. So now we're talking 30 plays a day. Mm -hmm. And, yes, the equipment staff is going to – be mindful of of his history. The team is mindful of his history before they drafted him number 18 overall, and they were comfortable with the idea that it's not a chronic thing, it's not a terrible thing, and he can they can manage it. So they're, they're comfortable with it. Jalen Phillips has so much potential. It's scary. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, a 260 pound, six six guy, six five guy, running four five four. He's it's just otherworldly. Mm-hmm. Scary. Great Scary. stuff from Armando Salguero of the Miami Herald. You can reach him at his name on Twitter. Uh, you can also catch all of his podcasts and videos there through the Miami Herald. And right now he is going to enjoy the rest of his vacation and probably not think about the Miami Dolphins during the course of that trip. Armando, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Armando. Oh, it's my pleasure. See you guys in December. Yep. We'll Be see well. You.